Hello and welcome to Heartbreaking Happy Hour. My name is Zoe and I'm here with my co-host today, Dr. Pamela Gurley, as well as some other special guests. Um, Pamela, do you want to say hi? Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Happy Wednesday it is. And today's an ex- especially, I almost said especially, especially happy Wednesday because today we have an exciting panel of guests joining us for this episode, which is aptly titled Whining about writing and wine whining is spelled w-i-n-e i-n-g because much like the name might suggest it involves wine and writing two of our favorite things now our wine that we're drinking today is marquette reserve 2016 and it's from the boyden valley winery in vermont now i actually picked this one because one i was just in vermont and two i'm working on writing a story about some of north america's lesser known wineries so it made sense it's a dry, robust red with rich flavors of dark plum, red berries, and soft undertones of chocolate and vanilla. It's uh, oh, and it's good. red. Yes, it is good. It is good. And um, I'm a red wine you know, drinker I, too, so that's always nice. It is nice. You know, I would. Uh, I what was going to say. Um, I would have brought some, but I, my suitcase was chock full coming back from Vermont, so I could not bring any. I couldn't bring anything else. I was actually over. I had to throw out my hair curlers uh, in the Burlington Airport. So I'll have to make a trip back there. <laughs> okay, so today uh, um, our writers lineup consists of a variety of writers, and they're all accomplished in either uh, journalism, literary writing, creative writing. Um, but they uh, have all everyone's been published. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to read a little bit about them. First up, we have Dawn Alcott, and she is the owner of Alcott Media Marketing, and she's a full-time freelance writer and content specialist whose work has appeared on Bankrate, Forbes, The Motley Fool, LoopNet, and others. And her niches include personal finance, real estate, and insurance. And next, we have Anna Lane, and Anna is a former touring fan comedian who writes about parenting with a humorous scent. And her work has been seen on the Washington Post, the Week and Refinery29, and she currently works as the parenting editor for Reviewed.com, a division of USA Today. Madison Dapsovic is a science journalist for IFL Science, a contributor to a number of publications and a digital content producer for the Ocean Exploration Trust. She covers a wide variety of topics, from medical marvels to space-bound exploration, and most recently, deep-sea research, when she served as a Science Communication Fellow above the Exploration Vessel Nautilus in America and Samoa. Wow, I'm getting excited reading. <laughs> I'm like, these, these are just super impressive, so I'm really excited for you guys to talk to everyone. Um, next we have Asana Hussein, and she is a journalist, writer, and editor whose credits include Delta Skyline Magazine, USA Today, California Business Journal, Edible Communities Magazine, Cuisine Noir, and more. And as a featured journalist who works on the gamut, but she primarily focuses on lifestyle, travel, dining, business, and profile features. Next is Ann Roderick Jones, and she is a freelance writer and editor who contributes, contributes to Architectural Digest, Vogue, Marie Claire, and many other national publications. She covers everything from travel to women's issues. And we have Kelsey Roslin, and she is a co author of the upcoming book, 111 Places in Austin You Must Not Miss. And she's contributed to the Huffington Post, Bustle, Bust, and more. And finally, we have Zara Hanawalt, and she is a freelance writer whose bylines include Glamour, Marie Claire, Parents, the Huffington Post, and she covers parenting, health, style, and entertainment. So welcome, everyone. And um, everyone is unmuted, right? I hope so. <laughs> everyone want to say hi? Everyone, anyone hi. Hi. say hi? Hi. Hey. Hello. Hi. Okay, cool. Hello. Hello, everyone. So since we have so many people, um, the first question, I, and, I'll kind of, and I'm going to kind of go ask everyone this individually, uh, just because this first one, I feel like, because everyone is so accomplished, uh, obviously I've read some very impressive media publications on there with every, every single person in this group uh, is extreme, has, is, has earned their right to be called a serious writer. And I think what I... I think I just said backed it up, so I think I want to give everyone about an minute or so to answer this. Well, I will um, 
I'll start backwards. I'll go up. But I want to ask everyone, basically, how did you get into writing and uh, you know your education, training, or was it just some luck? So let's start with Zara. Is it Zara or Zara? I'm sorry. I always say Zara. It's Zara. It's Zara. 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 Okay, Zara. Zara. How did you – we're starting with this. The Z, us, Z is always the last. So for this question, you get to go first. How did you get into writing? Okay. Yeah, well, I went to Drexel University in Philadelphia, and one mm-hmm. of the things Drexel does is they have a thing called a co-op program. So your junior year, you spend half the year interning, and you get credit for that. Uh, when it came time for me to apply, I just really wasn't interested in any anything I was seeing basically through the school that, that you know you could kind of apply to, and it would go through the school for your application and things. And I decided to just kind of do my own search. And mm-hmm. I kind of on a whim decided to apply to a few magazines. And so I did, and I got an offer from Seventeen Magazine. I worked as a web editorial intern there. And that mm-hmm. just kind of fed me into the industry. You know, I had always loved writing, but I was more of a creative writer up until then. And mm-hmm. that experience kind of opened me up to the possibility of working in journalism. So I did that internship. I did a few others in New York City. And then I decided to get a master's. So I went to Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism for my master's degree. I came mm-hmm. out of that about almost seven years ago now. And I had a few staff positions since, and I'm a pretty new mom. I have 11-month-old twins, so I decided to go freelance to give me a little bit more flexibility to be at home with them. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Okay, that's all. That, that's oh, that's pretty impressive. Okay, let's go with Kelsey. Kelsey, what, you, what do you? Uh, Kelsey, what do you have? Um, What's your story? And by the way, I just want to pause and just say, if anybody is having um, issues uh, listening online with your friends, it doesn't work on Safari. I believe that we it works on. I believe that the uh, streaming station works on Chrome. But don't worry if you're having trouble. Uh, that we will be on iTunes afterwards, so um, you'll be able to hear this in all of its glory as many times as you want. Uh, but yeah, so Chrome's uh, the internet browser if you're looking to um, to listen. All right, sorry about that. Okay, Kelsey, uh, what's your what? How did you become? How did you become? Uh, how, uh, we'll talk about the awesome later. But how did you become uh, to where you're at today? Definitely. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Awesome. Um, it started with the love of reading originally. I kind of never thought about being a writer. I just growing up as a kid was lucky to have parents that encouraged me to just always be at the library reading. When it came mm-hmm. time for college, I was between circus school or a school in Colorado, and so I ended up going to my local university in Colorado and just picking the one degree I knew I was interested in, which was writing, because it would involve Wait. reading, and I thought I'd figure out the rest later. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, did you say out. circus school? Did you say circus school? Yeah. yeah, I used to do a lot of, like, fire performing and stuff, so I was, like, 18, and I was like, what should I do? Get a degree or a circus? And I decided to get a degree. <laughs> Which I'm sorry, that's, <laughs> I'm that's very that, thankful you, you, for. You have hands down one of the most uh, interesting college decision story I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. So, but please continue because I, I just had to. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I pushed through it and I lucked out with getting a really great. Um, female mentor in my journalism internship for a travel magazine called Go World Travel, um, and I started uh-huh. out just doing, like, odd tasks for her, copy editing, things like that, and she really took me under her wing, like, really mentored me all the way up to the point of when I graduated college, I was her um, assistant editor at that magazine, so it was a really great experience to just have that strong mentorship, and then I started freelancing a lot on my own, as well as, like, contributing to Bustle and being on staff with them for a little bit. And then I got to the point where I pitched um, a book for a travel series, and they they took my pitch after a lot of work, and so I'm working on that right now. It's been really great. That is, that is, that's awesome. And do you still do any circus performing? I do, yeah, sometimes. I did one at a holiday showcase here in Austin last year. So festival world. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Anne, Anne, you um, you've got Archite- Architectural Digest, Vogue Marie Claire. How did you get into? Uh, how did you get in? End up on that level because those are some impressive names as well. 
Thanks. Um, I actually went to college for fashion merchandising um, because I wanted to own a bridal shop. That was kind of my dream. But um, after college, the first job that I got was for a travel website, and it was a startup. And so we all just kind of pitched in, like, if anyone's worked at a startup, you're putting together chairs, mm-hmm. it might be, I mean, doing whatever tasks are needed. And one thing that was needed was that um, they needed writing for the website. And so they needed reviews of hotels and restaurants. And it was just something that I kind of fell into and ended up doing for that site. And then I moved to New York, and rather than working at a bridal shop, I ended up on staff at The Knot Magazine for five years. And oh, that's so, super cool. Yeah, it was kind of really the best of both worlds there. And once I mm-hmm. got, um, you know, once I was at the magazine, it really opened a lot of doors for me as far as working with this amazing group yeah. of women and some incredible editors. And from there, I just ended up taking some advanced writing classes, and I did an internship at Sever, and then um, I went freelance shortly after. Okay, well, that and that's. Again, that's awesome, and I and I think you know weddings are one of those things that people people will always be getting married. So that's one of those uh, I guess timeless <laughs> industries. People always yes. there will always as long as there's human beings, there will be brides and grooms, and people always uh there will never be any shortage of that. Um, it's like kids, yeah, kids, kids right. and marriages, yep. they'll always be there. <laughs> yep, okay, so um, true. that is true. Okay, Roxana, you have a you have a. You've gone from Delta Skyline, the magazines in the back of the uh, seats, right? That's what Delta Skyline magazine is, right? If you're on the uh, Delta you, and you're stuck on the tarmac, we get to read your work? Um, yes, you absolutely should be able to. <laughs> that is, yeah. That's great. I'm going to look for it now, all right? So how did you get started? <laughs> I actually um, was educated outside of the U.S., so I was raised uh, mostly in India and Oman, and mm-hmm. uh I did not go to school for journalism. I actually earned my bachelor's in sociology. Um, Back in the 90s, uh, my parents did not think journalism was a safe profession for women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. um, I chose to study something where they couldn't tell me what to do, so that was sociology. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I ended up coming to the United States um, at the age of 26. Uh, I was married and I was new, but was just, about two years before the the you know big uh, recession that we had in 2008, yes. so nobody was hiring. Um, my prior experience in India was in uh, content management, not necessarily journalism. It was more corporate communications, um, and I could not find anyone hiring for that here in the U.S. Um, right. So at the time, home base was Atlanta, and I used that time to really just volunteer, build my network, sort of get to know people, get to know how the industry works um, here, and um, really found my footing um, introducing myself in networking events to editors, um, PR folks, um, people in the media industry that I could um, connect with, and managed to find a copy editing position at a local magazine and that editor sort of um, made a few introductions for me and I was able to find a couple of freelance writing positions. So I started with a lot of local print and online media in Atlanta um, writing Mm -hmm. freelance and I've kind of continued to do that. Uh, But the majority of my freelance work, including um, pieces in Delta, have all come from uh, introductions that I've made. It's mostly I've Try to stay away from pitching stories. I really like to build um, long-term relationships with editors and uh, like to work with editors that want to assign stories. So that's kind of more uh, what mm-hmm. my freelance work has focused on over time. Yeah, and now I, I full-time freelance. I've since moved from Atlanta to L.A., and L.A. Mm-hmm. is now home for the last four years, and that was, again, a beast of its own, and I had to find my footing all over again, moving east coast to west. But so far, things are yep. good. Yeah, yep. that's that that well, that's awesome. Congrats, congratulations on your success too. And now we, we have Madison. And at first, I thought you might have the coolest story about your deep sea research, but I think that the circus school is winning out. But try to wow <laughs> us with your story, and we'll see what we can, we can get. <laughs> it's still gonna be interesting. <laughs> that is totally valid. I am not a circus 
performer by any means, <laughs> but I have a lot of friends that are, so I will say it's a pretty pretty incredible talent to have. Um, I got started in journalism. Like Kelsey, I was just an avid reader and writer, um, and I loved to journal and document everything from a very young age. So I still actually have my first journal from, like, first grade, and it has this Winnie the Pooh cover with a little, you know, kind of – coding padlock thing to open it it's totally silly um I know I know it's still there uh so I've always been interested in in like writing and in documenting and in sort of telling these stories uh and so I started at a young age I up through middle school and high school I was on you know the the school newspapers and the the yearbooks um all the way up until I graduated in college um I actually I studied journalism in undergrad, but I, I moved back east to Washington, D.C. and worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years thinking that maybe politics was more my scene or political journalism was, was sort of calling to me. But I'm originally from Alaska, and I spent a lot of time in Montana. And after living in the city for a few years, I realized that I really needed to get back to the wilderness. So I yeah. moved, <laughs> I was like, get me out of the concrete jungle, put me back in the forest. So I moved to Montana um, at the University of Montana where I studied environmental science and natural resource journalism at their graduate program. And it just connected with an, a ton of amazing researchers with incredible journalists as well and really sort of embedded in this field of science journalism, of learning from people who are doing the research and then taking those complex ideas and breaking them down into, you know, more digestible bits for, for people of all backgrounds to understand and to enjoy and then to take that and apply it to their everyday life. So really that's kind of what journalism has always been about for me, like how do you take these really complex issues and how do you make them not only understandable but make them relatable and a part of people's lives? Like why should people care about science? And, and if they understand it, if they um, know how it impacts their lives, then that brings validity to everything and all of the amazing work that's going on in the research field. Well, that's, that's awesome. And we need people, trust me, people need science more than, than ever, uh, we, and, and I can't imagine, and especially now and today, when I feel like we do have to uh, really, really kind of break things down for people, and we'll get into that later. But that is awesome. So now, and it, we've got next. We have Anna. Anna, you've got a high bar to live up to, but it, uh, based on everyone else, it looks like you've also got some big names. So let's hear about you. I would say that I actually sort of fell into writing as a career. Uh, I was a touring stand-up comedian for 10 years. So, oh. of course, I wrote all my material, but I didn't realize that I was a writer. And then I um, got pregnant and had my son, and I could no longer tour anymore. So I started blogging back when mommy blogging was still somewhat of a small business, not the big business that mm -hmm. it is now. And yes. so I did that for a couple of years, and then I realized that, oh, my gosh, I could get paid to do stories <laughs> that I'm putting on my blog for free. So I yep. started pitching, and I, I got freelance work, and then I got a job uh, as the Los Angeles editor for Stroller Traffic, which has long since been purchased by another entity. And then it just snowballed from there, and I, I, I honestly got the big name – gets from cold pitching or from pitch calls and I did not know what I was doing when I started and now that I'm an editor and that I get pitches from other writers I am so embarrassed with the pitches that I sent out but uh, <laughs> it was sheer dumb luck it was just the universe giving me a job and <laughs> I'm grateful for it well I completely understand the dumb luck and I guess I'll tell my story, I'll tell my story at the end here because I don't know if many of you guys here. But yeah, that's that that's that's great, and congratulations and congratulations on being. So, what do you like more? Though I'll ask you because I'm I think you might be the only editor. What do you like more, being an editor or being a writer? You know what I didn't realize about editing before I started doing it full time mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of spreadsheets, there's a lot of emailing. So mm -hmm. that part of it is kind of a grind. You know, having to assign the stories and then having to edit stories and sometimes you get stories back and they're abysmal 
and you have to figure oh, out how to be kind to a writer because I would never want to kill someone's joy. Of course, I, I want to be a good editor, but uh, on the other hand, I also am the face of a publication, and I have to turn out something that's good for the people signing my paycheck. So it's a lot of that. It's a it's a lot of sort of walking on eggshells amongst everybody. But I yep. I like writing as well. It's it's all fascinating. And this is my first real full time job in on the writing side. So yep. from that, it's been an incredible learning experience, and I feel that I've grown so much as a writer from being an editor yes. as well. well that, that, I'm then that does, and it obviously sounds like it's worked out for you. And finally, on yeah. this question, we have Dawn. Dawn, how did you get started, and what brought you to where you're at today? Hi. Um, well, I think my story, Madison's story, really resonates with me because just being a reader and writer my whole life, um, and then I basically, in eighth grade, I realized that freelance writing and journalism and reporting were something that people could turn into a career, and people actually made a living doing this, and yeah. from that point on, I knew I wanted to be a freelance writer. Um, after college, I went back to visit my old high school, and I had been, of course, on the radio station, the newspaper, everything related to media. At that mm -hmm. point, my old radio station advisor introduced me to someone who owned a local paper in right near my town, started okay. writing for him, um, and then he connected me with uh, audiovisual trade magazines, which was just like trade journalism, uh, multi-title yeah, publishing uh -huh. house. So there were um, five magazines there. And I came in as an editorial assistant, worked my way up to editor of a magazine called Band and Orchestra Product News. So it was all about school music education, which is something yeah. I'm still passionate about and still love. And then following that, I went freelance because it was, right, I'm out on Long Island. And basically, I topped out my salary, topped out anything that I could have done with magazine publishing on Long Island right. and didn't want to go into the city. This was 2001. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so took the magazines. Now, we had five magazines at this publishing company, so I started writing for three of them, and that formed the basis of a really good freelance career. And yeah. since then, it's evolved. I am also former editor of a paintball magazine, believe it or not, uh, which is a hobby <laughs> my husband and I share. <laughs> it's that is not so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's still not circus acts, but yeah. <laughs> still having fun, um, but that's still pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, then I I moved into. So, so I edited Painful Sports for a while, and this was right around the time that blogging and the web was really getting heavy into content and content marketing. So from there, I started writing for places like Chase Bank, and oh, thinking back, it was a small personal finance site called Credit Shout. I wrote for Reviews.com. All sorts of things like that, and I realized that what I love is helping small business owners promote their business on the web. So now, my business is a shift, is a mixture of those names that I mentioned to you: um, Motley Fool, which is their Million Acres real estate site; Loopnet, which is commercial realty; uh, Bankrate, which is personal finance, and helping small business owners. Um, through blogging and web content and inbound marketing, just helping them drive traffic to their site and increase their business on the web. That that's great. And you know what? I think industry publications actually. You ever people are like, oh well, you know, it's not the Washington Post, not New York Times. Honestly, industry publications get read. I think more than even a lot of you know mainstream media articles. I think mainstream media people go there and they want to just fight the comments. And I worked in franchising. You know. Uh, oh, the franchising yeah. times that it, it was getting read by every franchisor, every franchise consultant, franchisees, franchise brokers. Everybody was reading the franchise times when it would come out because it was so relevant to what we were doing, and it was actually having really good information. It wasn't just like oh, let's go to the comments and argue about Trump and Clinton and Obama or whatever. It was people were actually reading it. So I so I think there's a lot of value in that, you know. And and uh, so that's awesome. Uh, my story. I'll give it real quick. Uh, I was um. 
of 2013, um, I was, I was, it was the summer of 2013, I was, I had like a little blog, and in high school I'd had a little MySpace blog, and you know, I never, I wanted to go to school because, so like, to be a writer, but like Roxana's parents, my parents also said that I, they were like, you're going to end up working at Starbucks if you go to school for writing, so go to school for business and IT, which I did, I graduated, um, <laughs> I was in graduate school, and I was kind of going, going through a little bit of an emo phase in 2013, and so I was writing on, uh, has blog and blog was about well, I was mad at my parents about something. I was like the blog is I don't want kids and blah blah blah. And so I, I was I was in I was on CNN in the comments and I remember I just posted something and someone's like oh woman's place in the kitchen and I'm like f you troll I don't want kids read my blog. I mean I was that was gosh <laughs> six years ago and so I was, you know, I was a little bit younger and more naive about anything so I remember saying oh you know F you troll read my blog and then I forgot about it and then two days later I get this email and says hey you know my name's uh, Rachel and I'm a editor at CNN I'm interested in you know turning your blog into an opinion piece and I'm thinking okay this is total spam but I look at the email and I'm like wow the email's legit and I google her and I'm like oh she's legit like, wow and so basically she said let's maybe take out the uh, multiple uses of the F word and uh, maybe stop yelling in caps about how mad you are at your parents. Uh, but I wasn't even mad about I, was, I love my parents. I was mad about some stupid stuff because I felt they cared more about my sister than me. It was the dumbest thing ever. It was the dumbest blog. <laughs> so I wrote the whole thing, took out about my anger at my parents, just wrote about uh, my decision, my whatever, whatever, whatever. And I thought it was going to go on the back, you know, back opinion page, which it started out on August 1st, 2013. And this is the day that became the... Uh, probably the most hated woman in America because the thing was just, I don't want kids. Well, that is not okay when you're a woman who's like 25. You, you need to have kids. So I, so uh, I, then they moved, and people were commenting so much, it moved to the homepage. And then next thing you know, it was it just, it, it was uh, the 2013's most commented story, which says something about the fact, yeah, people just want to argue with each other in the comments because it wasn't even that good. When I read it again, I'm like, it was terrible. It was really, really awful. Uh, I cringe to read it. Uh, <laughs> it was like, it was terrible. Like, I, had, I didn't even know style rules. I just looked all over red line ads. I'm like, I don't care, whatever. I'm like, I'm awesome. And then after that, I kind of, so I was like, and so I was like, I'm going to go write for wherever. And then I, a lot of places <laughs> did not think that I was, you know, I got a lot of rejections at first, but Elite Daily picked me up. And then, I got an op-ed in Newsweek, and over the next, you know, few years, I sort of started uh, started getting more work. And then I was also doing a uh, full-time technical writer. And then by 2017, I was writing for The Source, you know, Hip Hop Magazine. I still write there as a staff writer. And then this last year, I was like, well, I'm young, really going to go for it. I'm really going to push push through, really try to get some names. Um, because at this point, I had learned a lot more about writing. I had learned a lot more about being humble. I had learned, <laughs> basically, you can't just – say I wrote for CNN I'm a big deal and because that doesn't really work with editors um, but I did I landed um, with Zora by Medium magazine NBC News and I've got a bunch of other stuff coming out um, next month so I think for me it was just a matter of uh, I went from you know backwards I started out really really big and I had to realize oh I, I was are people gonna think I'm just a one-hit wonder um, if they are what am I gonna do to how can I not make that happen so it took about two years for me to make, you know, figure out how to not not just be this one hit wonder. Because I was like, I don't want to be like the dude who just uh, the dude who just sang the uh, Macarena. Because nobody knows his name, everyone knows the song. We don't know who sang that, you know. Uh, so I don't want to be that one hit wonder. So you know, that was my story. Um, and and I, you know, I think with you were thinking about networking. Um, networking is a big part of it. Uh, you know, uh, meeting people um, through professional networking groups and such. So. And I'm going to put this question out there, and whoever, answer, whoever wants to answer, feel free to jump in. What would you tell other people about – what would some tips be you'd give about the value of networking, how to best network, um, how to best network or pitch? Let's do network or pitch. Whoever's ready, just jump in. I'd like to this talk about Anna. networking. Oh. Okay, well, I heard Anna first. Go ahead, Anna. I think I heard Anne. Uh, this is Anna. So I was going to say with okay. networking – the thing that was the most effective for me that I, and I honestly have no idea how I even found out about it were these private Facebook groups for female writers or female identifying writers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? And then someone put me in one and then there's so many of them and there's editors in them and there's writers in them and they have valuable advice. 
they have tons of seasoned writers and new writers and you meet people and you find out what they're writing on and sometimes they'll give you an editor's email. I've done the same. I mean, it was Mm -hmm. eye-opening. It was mind-blowing. It was the most valuable thing I've ever done was to stay on Facebook for that reason and to stay in those groups and be active in those groups. It was Mm -hmm. life-changing, life-changing, put money in my pocket. That that's a hundred percent true. And uh, for the newer, if anyone's listening who's a newer writer, once we're tweeting this, I will I'll share some of the public finders groups that are better for newer writers. Because I think um, some of them, the ones I know that we're all in, are a little bit more seasoned. But there are there's a lot of great great um, starting writers groups. And sometimes I do I belong to them. I sometimes give advice. Uh, I don't follow them because I don't feel. If I get if I follow all that writing stuff, I get sucked in. Next, you know, half my day is wasted, like eating popcorn, watching these people fight. But yeah, um, I will share some of the value. I will share some of the good writing groups for uh, starting writers to uh, join up with. <laughs> okay, who else has an opinion about networking or pitching? Um, I can comment I on pitching. Anne. This is Anne. Um, um, so I also work part time as an editor for Sherman's Travel, and I've worked for them for a, like. I don't know, seven years. So I do get pitches all the time, but being a freelancer myself, I pitch as well. So I think a couple of you mm-hmm. in the group were also kind of in the same boat. But I think it's so hard. It can feel so daunting to just cold pitch an editor. And I think, um, you know, I really tried hard to answer all of the pitches. But I think one thing that's really helpful is, one, reading the content on the site, which I think a lot of people you know, if you're not, if the site doesn't write in first person, or if they're service pieces, you're pitching those things, and you can say, "This goes in. I want to pitch this for this particular section of the site, whatever it may be, whether it's a hotel review or a cruise section, and you're a cruise expert." But also, just getting in something personal. Um, this is obviously not necessary for me, but if I saw that, like an editor, you know, or if someone had read um, a story that I had written and they want to talk about it because maybe they are child-free, too, and so they want to have mm-hmm. a discussion about that. But just finding something personal is such a great mm-hmm. way to connect with an editor that um, you don't know. You don't, you know, they've yeah. never heard your voice or seen your face, or you might not live in New York or L.A. And so I think just mm-hmm. being able to find that personal connection, stalking them on social media and finding out something not creepy about them that you can connect with is so important. And then getting your pitch right, and it's super easy, you know, just to, like, say, this is the section I want to write for. This is what I can write for you. I can deliver it on time, and I can send you a Dropbox of photos or whatever might be easiest for that editor. But um, I always cool. I always feel like a little bit of personal connection certainly helps. I think that that's – I think that you just really hit a hit a key point in that you're – when you're trying it, – it, pitching is somewhat like selling. You know, I've sold gym memberships. i sold used cars. I was really good at selling used cars. Uh, mm-hmm. But you have to ask <laughs> – a lot of lessons you learn. You ask people, you say, "Hey, um, say to them, hey, you basically you don't you can go in there and just say, okay, well, this is a 2006 Honda, and you know the engine's probably kind of not really working that well, but you should buy it. Here's why, why, why. You ask them, you say, okay, well, so where do you drive to? Do you drive to school? You ask questions. Do you drive to school? Do you drive to work? Um, how many, you know, do you have a lot of people in your family? Do you have a lot of road trips? And you're asking these things to get to know them. So then once you ask them. You can say, oh, okay, this person has a long drive to work and they need to be gas efficient. So then you can sell them on the gas efficient part. And I think the same, what you were saying is when you read, you read what the site is, you say, oh, okay, this site really specializes in, I'm looking at somebody's um, underwater, you know, ocean exploration. Okay, cool. Then find the editor. I really like this thing that you did. It, and this is how I can fit in. This, these are ideas I have that can fit in to you because it's a, it's a, it almost is a selling relationship, but you have to know what their what their needs are, what you have to know what their customer, quote, customer editor's needs are. So I think that you made a really good point. Um, who else wants to talk about pitching and networking? I would love to jump in on the pitching thing. This is Anna again. Listen, sorry. But, Anna again. Uh, okay. It's Anna. I would just wanted to say that for the pitching, when you're pitching an editor, don't just send me an email with your name saying that you'd love to be assigned an article that I get so many of those. And I like, if I put out a call for pitches on Twitter or in a Facebook group, I'm actually asking for a pitch. Like like I literally put a call out for a pitch. So yes, do the research, please read the site because 
if you don't read the site, like if you send me a personal essay for reviewed, we're not going to run it because it's not what we cover there. You know, like, I, yes, you're a great writer. I love your essay, but that is wasting your time and my time. But if you just send me your email being like, hey, I'm an awesome writer. Here's my website. I'm like, okay, but I, can't, I don't have cool. the time to check your website and then be like, what would you be perfect to write? I just, I don't, and it's not a personal thing. So that's my big advice. <laughs> As a writer for the source, I will say I, I get I get SoundCloud rappers sending me their links uh, every yeah. single. I get at least ten SoundCloud sure. rappers a day, and I'm just like, not only are these people terrible, but I'm just like, <laughs> you're this is they're just terrible, and they're not even like you stole someone else's beat. This is this is you <laughs> rapping over Post Malone's beat. Do you think that as a music writer, I wouldn't know this? I mean, come on, dude, come on. <laughs> oh God. All right. Who else? Who and now we can talk about the good, bad, and the ugly. Who else has good, bad, ugly networking or pitching that they want to talk about? Um, <laughs> this is Kelsey. Uh, I've definitely got hey, some good networking. Um, I feel like, especially, I mean, I'm pretty young in my career. Like I'm, I'm recently 25, and when I was working at a vintage clothing store here in Austin when I first moved here, I was really looking for a full-time writing position. And a girl mm-hmm. that worked with me, like, knew I was interested in that. She had a journalism degree, and when she got a full-time writing position. She immediately referred me, like, did the legwork to, like, lift me up. And then I got there. We both worked together. Yeah, and and then when I moved on, when that project closed, I got a full-time writing job, immediately recommended her. She's here now. So it's just, like, amazing to be able to see, like, turn around for a second and see, like, who could I be helping in my networking? And then you both get on the same platform, and they will usually do the same for you. Like, that stands out. People remember that, and I think that's just a really important lesson that I've taken with me and I just think it's it's really wonderful that now we've worked at three full time writing jobs together because we just keep immediately thinking like, Oh, this person really did this for me. They care about my career and my success as much as they're asking me to care about theirs and that stands out a lot. That's true and that pay it forward, um that pay it forward I think I swear it always pays off in the end. Uh Oh, I think our next pod, our next podcast to do with the writers. I think I'm going to call it the pitch party because now I'm like, this is this is fascinating. <laughs> okay. Who else has anything about? Who else has any anything about pitching and networking? This is Dawn. Uh, I love what Chelsea said about um, paying it forward and helping others. And one thing I'd like to say: the binders groups and the freelance content marketing writer. All of those online groups are fantastic. But one tip. Mm-hmm that I've been trying to share with writers that I mentor lately is get out there and do some real world networking because there's Mm -hmm. nothing like seeing someone face to face and maybe sharing lunch with them, going out for drinks, whatever it might be. Nothing replaces that. And I can say that I've landed like a hundred percent of the gigs where the business owner was local and I actually got to meet them and they become my longest term relationships. There is a, not an obligation, but like a trust and a friendship there that extends beyond what you can really develop online. And online relationships are also fabulous. But look for trade shows in your area. If you know there are finance writing um, and money seminars that I want to try to go to next year, I haven't had that opportunity yet with two young kids at home. And look for even writing meetups, whatever it may be. I'm lucky in that I'm in New York, but it, almost every major city is going to have something. Or even if it's just your local chamber of commerce meeting to meet up with local business owners and find stories you can pitch, interesting things in your community. Um, it's just so valuable to, to get out there and do that. Uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was Dawn, right? That was you, Dawn, right? Yeah, yeah. Don, and you were the and you were the one who was telling me you don't want to put on makeup today. <laughs> well, yeah, if I'm leaving the house, so you do I'm put on makeup and get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to give her a hard time about that. Exactly true. <laughs> okay, who is going to hop in next? <laughs> uh, this is Maddie. Don, I love it. I didn't want to put on makeup today either. <laughs> um, but yeah, I totally, totally agree. And, you know, I'm a millennial. I love social media. Social media is a huge component of the industry that we work in. 
but there's so much to be said for meeting people face to face. And I think that that is such a crucial part that um, sometimes maybe we forget that's even out there. And that go, you, pitching goes on both sides, right? As a journalist, you get pitched a lot of opportunities and press releases and ideas from people of many different backgrounds. And it takes such little effort to just respond to those and say, hey, I appreciate you thinking of me and considering me for this. You know, it's not right now, but, but maybe I'll love to pursue that in the future or give me a little bit more information. And then follow up with those people if they are local, you know, and, and understand and connect with them and, and create that sort of back and forth dynamic in person and attending, you know, conferences depending on what your niche is and what your background is just to get out there and meet people and really connect and put a face to your, your digital name, right? That, that is that and that is that is a great, great, great point. Um, okay, so now I want to kind of turn a little bit and talk about obstacles because writing like with all career uh, with all careers, you're going to have certain obstacles. So what is and I know we've all got a ton. I want if everyone could pop in and give me one one of your biggest ones and how you um, overcame it. So whoever wants to jump in, hop on in. Hey, this is Roxana, and I'd like to take a stab at that. Um, for me, the biggest obstacle was, I think, arriving in the U.S. just before the recession um, mm -hmm. when no one was hiring. And secondly, um, I think trying to uh, prove to folks that I could be a good writer or a good editor was tough. Yep. Um, just coming mm -hmm. straight from India and not having any educational background in the U.S., not having any work experience in the U.S., um, and really not having any kind of a professional or um, a personal network to kind of zone into and look for contacts or introductions or any of that. Um, so that was definitely a big roadblock in starting out in writing um, in, in this country, and I would say that uh, the networking part of it is what really helped. Um, on paper, you know, I've gone to school, I have a college degree, I have some work experience in India, some of it is in writing, so everything looked great on paper, but I, the constant feedback I kept getting from the phone calls I would do was, oh, if only we could, you know, see more of your work, if only we could see how mm -hmm. to do this. And I didn't have that, I didn't have any uh, published work in the U.S., I didn't have anyone right. to speak for the kind of work that I do. And so it became a lot of where I had to put in the initiative to go meet someone at a networking event, you know, go show up at, like you mentioned, um, Chamber of Commerce um, events or local uh, press club events, um, writing groups, um, and try to connect directly with a editor or someone in the content marketing field um, and to show that, okay, here, this is, this is who I really am. I can actually put two sentences together, you guys, <laughs> um, and once that happened and once they could make the connection and they realized that I wasn't you know just trying to make, make these things happen without having any prior experience like I knew what I was talking about I had taken the time to bring myself mm -hmm. up to speed about how things work um, that kind of helped in a way to um, overcome that roadblock and then once we once the introductions happened and people started connecting me to other people, you know, making referrals, recommendations, and the work kind of started flowing. So I do believe that sometimes you might see as much as you see on, on digital and you do have uh, what you see on paper, but having that one-on-one -on -one connection and being able to, you know, even just talk story ideas or angles or slants or whatever, um, that mm -hmm. really helps sometimes to um, – to show that, that you're capable of, of writing on whatever topic it is that you want to. Um, so for me, I think that was a big roadblock to overcome, and um, networking was the only way that worked for me. Yeah. That's, that, that, is, that is great. I think uh, building portfolio, there's, uh, you have to have a portfolio. It's, uh, because I think, hope the editors will agree, even if you can pitch the best story, I think you usually want to be able to see, hey, this is what I've done, because you have to, have, you have to be able to back it up. So, um, and I always, the editors, would the editors agree? You, does a, how much, I'll ask the editors this, how much does a portfolio play into the role of deciding whether or not to bring someone on or to give them a job, uh, even a, an assignment? 
this is Anna. I would say that the first thing is the pitch. The second thing is the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, someone who's a terrible writer can give a great pitch. It doesn't usually happen, uh-huh. but uh, so it does play a role. I mean, I if I'm down to two writers that I want to assign a story to, and they've both given me a great pitch, I'm going to then decide whose portfolio shined more and give them the story. Great. But not, or, you know, yeah. even, have a, even having a portfolio, that's... Oh, um, people yeah. Don't you need you a portfolio, have, yeah. <laughs> no, no, you, you have to have a website. You have to have a portfolio, mm-hmm. even if it's whatever, contently or whatever it is. I used to use that, yeah. but you have to have a website. Mm-hmm. This is t- almost 2020. You have to have that. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right, who else has an obstacle that they want to talk about? This is Dawn. Um, this is Anne. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Dawn, I heard oh. you first. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, the the biggest obstacle that I face is work life balance. It feels <laughs> <Yes>. like <laughs> I, <laughs> that's just it. It feels like I can either you know spend time with my kids, have a clean house, have a strong <laughs> career, and continue with everything. Pick two, and that's it. <laughs> um, I, I haven't really discovered a solution yet. I think probably whoever does discover a solution to that just has the secret to the world and life and everything. But what I try to do is keep meticulous details and records. That way I'm always tracking my assignments so I can keep everything on pace. And when things get slow rather than worrying, oh, I have to, you know, follow up with 20 clients that I sent letters to last week or respond to job ads or anything, I sort of take it in stride, say, okay, money's coming in, and now Mm -hmm. I can spend some time to volunteer. I volunteer with my kids' PTA or spend time with my kids or spend time with friends. Um, so it's kind of just riding the ebb and flow of freelancing that helps mm-hmm. with work-life balance. But man, mm-hmm. I wish there were an easier solution. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's always I think that's how a lot of uh, people who write feel. Uh, a lot of the technical writer, you know, I call them technical writer. What am I talking about? Um, it's hard because you sit there like, oh, well, I I get paid once I get this manual done, and if I get it done by Thursday, then I get paid next day. If I don't get it until Tuesday, I get paid next Tuesday. And, for me, it was more, and then I was like, oh, well, then I want to get that done. I can make another one. And next thing you know, you're just writing, writing, writing. And then you're like, oh, I've got all these story ideas, all these pitches. Well, what I did is I learned, I was said, oh, I'm not going to write on Saturdays. Like, I take Sunday off in the gym not to work out because my day I don't work out. So I said, well, what if there's a day I didn't write? And the day I chose not to write was Saturday. And that's the day to hang out with my friends, to relax, um, to, do, uh, to do things that are non writing related. Um, and for me, that that's setting aside a time to not work is uh, has been has been important to me. So, um, anyone else want to talk about how to jump on about the work life balance before we continue with obstacles? Because that's yeah, a good, that's a really, really good point. Challenging. I find it so challenging. This is Anna. It's even having a full time job, which is theoretically a set number of hours. I mean, mm-hmm. it's so challenging. There's just not enough of you to go around. There's not enough hours to go around, regardless of whether you have children or not. There's always things that need to be done. And there's just not enough hours in the day and not enough hours when you yep. can possibly keep your eyes open. You know, it's just, it's very hard. And women carry the mental load across the board. I mean, the times are changing somewhat, but, you know, my husband doesn't remember to make the doctor's appointments. He's never going to remember that. And he's a great partner, but you yeah. still have to, it's very hard. There's just not enough to go around. I always like to say, I need a wife, you know, mm-hmm. but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. And I think it's so, a lot of, a lot of it today with today's world, uh, even my husband will get home and be like, oh, you know, he gets home at 8 p.m. and says, oh, I've got, he said, he'll say, I've, he's got 300 emails. Um, yeah. he's, uh, and, you know, he'll say, I've got 300 emails. I could read them. Like, well, you know, but at some point you have to say, no, I'm not going to read these. Yeah. They'll be there tomorrow. This, nobody's going to die if I don't read these. I'm going to play a video game. And I think at some point you have to say, no, like, I'm just like say no, F it, I'm going to play the proverbial yeah. video game. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, um, that's a good point. Good advice. Oh, we've got about five minutes left. Who wants to talk about op- anyone who hasn't talked about obstacles and or work life balance? Hop on in. This is Zara, and I think an obstacle for me, it's just kind of been ongoing in my career, is mm-hmm. that I don't always feel taken seriously. 
as Mm. one, as a writer, and two, as a Mm -hmm. freelancer. And it's so frustrating. I don't think it's ever been to the point that I'd consider doing something else, but it's definitely to the point that I, I, I wonder about, you know, how I can present myself in a way that, that people take more seriously. And interestingly enough, I think when I freelanced, I felt it the most, even though those are the times that I've been working the most and the hardest and in many cases making the most money. So I think that's kind of a challenge we all face because it's not just a social thing. It's also affects how we get paid, how much we get paid, Mm -hmm. how Mm -hmm. timely our payments are in many cases. I can't even tell you the number of times I've had to chase down a payment as a freelancer. And Mm -hmm. um, I just think that's such a big issue facing all of us. And I haven't quite figured out how to overcome it yet. So if anyone else has thoughts, I'd love to hear them. (laughs) I would love to hear that I would, too. I, uh, yeah, I know for me, I'm. Uh, I don't. I can't. Still can't tell people I'm a writer. I'll be standing there at like a bar or something, and someone will say, well, "What do you do?" And I'll just stand there like dumbstruck and just. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll. I just I feel like if you say if you say I'm a writer, then they're gonna say oh, they're gonna assume you're either a blogger, which I you know, uh, like no, or you know, uh, or a. That I'm trying to write some romance novel. So I'll so lot most time I'll say technical writer or I'll let someone else speak for me. I'll just say, Oh, um uh and then someone else will look at me like I'm an idiot and say, Oh, she's a writer, she's written for and then they'll list me you on know, my bylines. I think for me but I do think that it's hard because it does seem like there's a negative com- connotation of, Oh, you're a right like so many people say they're a writer but if you can't back like if you can't back it up, it's it's almost become th- a joke, especially in twenty nineteen when anyone can put things online and uh, online and claim they're a writer. So yeah. Um well exactly. so I'd love you to see, else, Did you see that piece in Vice today? It was a great piece and I can tweet it to you guys, but it was the headline was any idiot can blog or something like that. That's sadly paraphrased. <laughs> but it was essentially about how there's this assumption that any idiot can be a writer, right? That you don't have to have any <laughs> skill to be a writer. It doesn't take any skill to be a digital journalist. And it was a brilliant, brilliant piece because it's exactly that. It's at the core of this lack of value for what we do, for what all writers Ooh, do. And good. it was yeah. so good. And I will send you the link. I'll find it. I read it this morning from a writer friend. It's, it was That's so good. Great. And so, so what the problem is. Yeah, that's really, impo- that's really important. Anyone else overcoming obstacles, how to say you're a writer and – not feel awkward about it. <laughs> Maybe some people don't feel awkward about it. <laughs> this is Dawn um, speaking as I, it seems like maybe one of the veterans here, one of the older writers, I'll just say it. Um, it does get better with time, I feel like, saying that you're a writer. And when you narrow it down to, I mean, you guys all have amazing credentials on, on this podcast. I'm sitting here starstruck at all you've accomplished you know, saying, you don't have to say I'm a writer. Well, I write for Vogue. I write for Marie Claire, like that. Lead with that, or in my Mm -hmm. case, I'm a content marketing specialist, or I'll lead with the benefit. I help help people with personal finance, and I help business owners with Internet marketing. Um, Just saying it with confidence makes all the difference, and it just takes a lot of practice and you still don't hit it 100%, but it does, once you kind of know what you want to say, it's, it's your elevator pitch, it becomes easier that it just flows off your tongue, and then eventually it starts to sound natural and feel comfortable, I think. Elevator yeah. pitch, that is, that's, that's great. That's, that, that's, really, that's brilliant. Uh, I'm going to make note of that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, because it's about that time, so we are going to. So they're going to. They're giving me the wrap up signal, and what um what I think uh well, I just want to first of all close out and say thank you for everyone for come uh for being on here. This has been awesome, and this has definitely been probably my favorite episode. I uh I do better as a group, and I think that you guys all really really did well in bringing out uh in, in really really sharing what it's actually like in the industry. It's not just cool putting words online and being like, look at what I wrote. There's a lot of um, back to it. And so I want to thank everyone for really giving multiple perspectives and also um, pointing out there's multiple journeys. Uh, a lot of people think there's this myth that you have to uh, like go to Columbia for journalism to be considered a, 
uh, to ever make it as a writer. And I think that today, what I really want to thank you all for doing is proving that you don't have to. You can um, fall into it. You can, go to, you can go to Northwestern, but you can also fall into it. Uh, you can uh, start in business. You can start at an industry publication. That's really the take-home message I want to. Uh, I hope our audience got. Um, this podcast will be available on iTunes, and we will be tweeting out a link later about it, hopefully tonight and maybe tomorrow. And we'll also, I'm also, we're also going to be tweeting um, we're also going to be tweeting every, uh, sharing, uh, tweeting, Instagramming, and Facebooking the links to everybody's Twitter. I think there's a few guys who don't have Twitter. We'll be sharing your Instagram. So you can uh, get in contact with all of our writers through their professional network in case you, oh, in case you want to hire them. In case, because uh, uh, in case, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you can afford them. We've got, we've got some big deals here, but, uh, or, you have any further questions but uh, mostly I do and I want to say that our next episode will be in two weeks and we will have Ashley McGirt a therapist talking about the travel the correlation between travel and therapy and Pamela are you on here to tell us anything more about that one well no it's just really exciting because Ashley is an author and of I try to travel it away and so she does some amazing work with, with trauma and looking at other reasons why people actually travel and it's not always about you know, just I just I, I'm doing it for pleasure. Some people use travel as a means to escape, and so just to hear what she's going to have to say and her powerful journey, it's going to be amazing. The other amazing thing is this is going to be recorded the next time, all the way from Israel. So that's going to be an an amazing, amazing, amazing show. Okay, awesome. Well, again, uh, thank you, everyone. Don't forget to follow us on social media and follow. Uh, Follow our writers on social media. We're going to be tweeting out everyone, tweeting, sharing, Facebooking, everywhere on the social media. We'll be sharing, <laughs> sharing with info. Uh, and have a great rest of two weeks. And cheers. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.